Good morning, uh, and uh, thank you for joining uh, this next edition of Nano Explorations. Uh, I hope uh, those of you from MIT had a chance to enjoy the last couple of weeks of possibly getting back into your labs and uh, resuming all of the research that is waiting for us back in those laboratories. Uh, my name is Vladimir Bulovic. I'm the director of MIT Nano, and uh, this morning I have an absolute pleasure to introduce uh, Morten Kjergård, um, who is a, a postdoc in the group of Professor Will Oliver. Um, they're doing remarkable explorations of quantum computing, and I am very excited to hear Morten uh, talk about, uh, indeed, programming a quantum computer with quantum instructions. Uh, just as in previous nano explorations, I would ask you to turn off your video, uh, mute your uh, volume. That way we will, one, increase the bandwidth for the rest of us and also not interfere uh, with the voices that might be in the background. If you have questions uh, for Morten, please keep them towards the very end. And uh, at that time, I will call upon you if you raise your hand or you can send a chat message and I will relate your question from the chat to Morten. With that being said, uh, Morten, please take over. Thank you, Vladimir. So, uh, it's a great pleasure to, I was going to say, be here today. I don't know if that's the euphemism uh, that we use right now, uh, but it's a great pleasure to be able to give this talk to you today, and I hope you're all you know, safe uh, and well wherever you are. Uh, so for the next roughly 25 minutes, I'll tell you about some results out of our group, the Engineering Quantum Systems Group. Oh, and let me just make sure that you can all see my mouse. Vladimir, can you confirm that you can see my mouse so I can use it as a pointer? Uh, yes, I can see your mouse. Fantastic. Okay, great. So I'll give a, uh, some overview of what we're trying to do in general with quantum computers and specifically what we call a superconducting quantum computer. And then in the latter half of the talk, I'll dive a little deeper into some details of the experiments uh, that we've been working on, some of the experiments that we've been working on lately. And normally I'd encourage anyone to interrupt me whenever you want, um, but uh, I'll keep the talk itself brief so there'll be uh, plenty of time for Q&A afterwards. Okay, so with that being said, I mean, what's the point about even caring about building a quantum computer? And so let me briefly define what a quantum computer is for you guys and give a couple of details that are typically omitted uh, when one hears a, a one sentence summary of quantum computers. So the idea is to use computations using quantum bits. These are essentially quantum two level systems. Now these computations have to be performed in a highly specific way. If you do that, uh, these quantum computers can provide computational speed ups for certain problems. And I highlight here in red, these two clauses that are typically not uh, uh, brought to the forefront when one hears a, a brief description of quantum computers. So I wanted to spend a few uh, minutes talking about, um, talking about exactly what I mean by this. Sorry, let me just start my, my, uh, my timer here. Okay, so what do I mean by certain problems? So if you ask a computer scientist to kind of lay out a map of the world of problems, they would uh, at least draw part of the map like this. So you can imagine if I give you some problem and I ask you, how hard is this problem to solve? You can kind of make a ranking of the hardness of these problems. And at the bottom of this rank, that is to say some of the more easy problems, um, they're, they're called problems in P, and P has a rather truce meaning. So I'll, I won't go into the details of why it's called P, so I just hope you'll you'll uh, trust me that we'll use the word P to define problems that are efficiently solvable and checkable on classical computers. Okay, so here are some concrete examples. Is this number a prime number? Turns out the answer is yes. Maybe uh, you learned this algorithm in grade school, given some, some number, you can pretty quickly determine if it's prime. You're solving a Rubik's cube. That's also pretty easy. That's why maybe you've seen these videos on YouTube of these you know, amazing nine-year-old kids that solve a Rubik's cube you know, in 20 seconds. That's because there's a very specific algorithm for any Rubik's cube that pretty quickly finds the solution. And of course, it's easy to check that your Rubik's cube is solved correctly. You know, just stare at it for a second, turn it around, and you can see all the sides are in the same color. And finding the shortest path here shown in green between two points, that's also a P problem. Now, there's a much larger class of problems, which is uh, a lot more interesting in some sense. This is called NP. And again, the name is kind of obtruse, so I'll just stick with the acronym NP. So these are the problems that are efficiently checkable, but not efficiently solvable on a classical computer. Okay, so here are some famous examples from that group. One is what I uh, show as a cartoon here called the traveling salesman problem. And the problem here is to say, you know, is there a path that connects, let's say, the 25 largest cities in the US that's less than you know, 6,000 miles, for example. 
Now, it can be very hard to find that path, but once you have the path, it's pretty easy to check. It's less than 6,000 miles. You just, just you know, go to Google Maps and you'll see that you'll see you're all set. Uh, protein folding is another problem in NP. And here on the right, I show something called a click problem, which you may or may not have heard about, but the idea is that each of these nodes here can represent a person, for example, a Facebook user. And you can ask, is there a part of this a network of users where all the users know each other? It's called a click problem. And you can imagine that problems like this have broad uh, use in uh, you know, classical data analysis of networks such as Facebook, Netflix, and so on. So, so these are all NP problems. But now I want to tell you about uh, this other class of problems. That's the one that relates to quantum computers. It's called BQP. Again, the names of truths. We'll stick with the acronyms. And these are the problems that are efficiently solvable on a quantum computer. And the amazing thing here you'll notice is that BQP has some overlap with NP. So some of the problems that are in NP that are very broadly interesting are also in BQP. So this means that problems that used to be very hard, essentially impossible as they become large, as the problems become big enough, become solvable on a quantum computer. And this is what I mean by certain problems. So let me give three examples uh, of quantum computing. So now let's take the same number that we had before, but I'm not gonna ask, is it a prime number? I'm gonna ask, what are the prime factors? That is to say, which two prime numbers do I multiply to get this number? That's one of the things that's uh, much, much, much faster to do on a, class, on a quantum computer. Uh, there's a thing known as knot invariance. This is a really beautiful mathematical theory that tells you that these five knots, although they look distinct, they are in fact the exact same knot. It's called the knot invariant. And perhaps most importantly, and um, maybe most applicable in the near term is the notion of quantum simulation. So here I've just taken a picture of a bunch of spins laid out on a lattice. And you could imagine asking, of course, all kinds of questions about these spins. Um, depending on how they're coupled and so on and so forth, you'll be able to do quantum simulation of um, large systems that are essentially intractable on classical computers. And in fact, the proof that quantum computers um, can solve these quantum simulations problems exponentially faster uh, was developed by Seth Boyd, who's a professor here at MIT. Okay, so with that kind of brief background on where quantum computers fit into the landscape of solving problems, I wanna to turn to, uh, yeah, so this is just a one-liner that quantum computers fundamentally change what is computationally feasible. So now I wanna to change to showing you kind of where we are now, or at least one aspect of where we are now in this field. So late last year, uh, something known as a superconducting quantum computer. I spent a little bit of time explaining what this word superconducting means in this context. But this quantum computer outperformed the world's largest classical supercomputer. A pretty phenomenal experimental uh, uh, demonstration. So here is a picture, uh, very much a cartoon picture, of the quantum processor that was used in this experiment. Each of these gray X's are uh, aluminum microfabricated, uh, essentially capacitors. You can imagine one of these excesses, you should think of it as being roughly a couple hundred microns by a couple hundred microns to give you a sense of the scale here. So this was supposed to have been 54 qubits, but one of them didn't work. So this is a 53 qubit uh, quantum computer. And these blue guys are just couplers that can turn on and off the coupling between these quantum two level systems, these qubits. And down here is just a cool picture of the actual uh, chip itself, where this black box right here is where these um, nano-fabricated qubits live, and all these wires right here are just control electronics. So let me uh, show you this plot that is, in some sense, the first demonstration of a quantum computer outperforming the world's largest classical computer. Okay, so what's going on here? So on the x-axis of this first panel, you have the number of qubits that are involved. And on the y-axis, you have the quality of some calculation that was performed. I'm not going to go into the details of what exactly was calculated, but they calculate one of those things that we expect to be very hard classically, uh, but quote unquote easy on a quantum computer. So let's focus up here at 53 qubits. This is where they use the full uh, power of the quantum computer. Let me just move this over. So here they use the full power of the quantum computer. So what they do is they execute this program and then they try to simulate using uh, the supercomputer, the same quantum program using classical uh, resources. And over here, it took them roughly, as you can see, roughly five hours to confirm the quantum calculation. And using the quantum computer, it took roughly 200 seconds. So now what they can do is they can extend this even further out by slightly changing the program that they execute on the quantum computer, making it even harder for the classical computer to confirm the calculation. And so what they end up with is this estimate of roughly, and, and I should really emphasize that this is an estimate because of course they couldn't do it, 
that if they use all the resources on this uh, supercomputer, um, it would take roughly 10,000 years to confirm the output of the quantum computer. And it took 200 seconds. So here's the one line summary of that. They used 53 supernova qubits, a specific type called a transmon, in case anyone has heard about this. Uh, and this is a result from the Google Quantum AI team. And they took roughly 200 seconds to do something that's expected to take between 10,000 years, but in fact, all the way down to just a few weeks. Because of course, after this initial experimental demonstration, uh, there was some theory follow-up work by other teams who maybe were a little bit jealous uh, that showed that you can in fact speed up the classical simulation somewhat. But even in, let's say, the most pessimistic case, uh, you're still doing something in 200 seconds that is expected to take uh, between two and three weeks on the world's largest classical computer. So this is kind of the state of the art. Um, so where is the field now going? So this will be uh, my, almost my last intro slide, and then I'll begin to some few more details of what we've been doing. So uh, quantum computing using superhuman qubits is kind of built on a foundation of these four uh, pillars, which is classical control. That is to say, we have to deliver some signal down to the quantum computer. This is typically in a dilution refrigerator. Uh, so for those of you who don't know, these are refrigeration units that cool down to just a few millikelvin, essentially. These are, of course, big beasts, um, and they have to be very carefully shielded both thermally and electrically. And so the, uh, delivering the classical control to the qubits themselves is a rather hard task. Uh, we're also working on improving the physical qubits themselves. Um, we're working on improving the readout of the qubit. That is to say, when you ask a qubit, are you in the zero or the one state, um, the quality of that answer is in fact itself a very large research direction to basically push up our confidence in these numbers. And finally, uh, we're working on improvements to native gates. And this means that when you try to do a logical operation on your quantum computer, so you try to flip a bit, for example, we call that a gate or a logical gate. This is a nomenclature from electronic engineering. Uh, and the notion of native gates is just what's the, let's say the easiest gates for the quantum computer to do. So we're trying to improve all these four things. And so each of these boxes are large uh, independent research fields essentially, but built on this foundation, there's kind of two tracks being pursued simultaneously in the world of, of uh, super and quantum computing. And I should say several other quantum computing architectures as well. So one is this idea of something called a fault tolerant quantum computer. And the idea here is that if you take some of these, let's say uh, noisy qubits, so I should say that the state of the art error rate for qubits is roughly uh, one in a hundred, something like that. So this means that as you try to perform some calculation, uh, every roughly, this is very rough, one out of a hundred of your logical operations will fail. Now, just to put that into context, if you pick up your mobile phone and you ask how many errors do I get in my, in my processor on my phone, you're looking at roughly one uh, out of a 10 to the 15. So I guess on the order of one in a billion billion. Uh, and on, on quantum computers, we're looking at one in a hundred. So errors are abundant. And so there's this idea that you can put together many noisy qubits into one larger qubit, it's called a logical qubit, uh, which will essentially be error-free. So this is this left path. Right here. But then there's another path here on the right, which is also interesting. And uh, this has the kind of nickname, noisy intermediate scale quantum computers. And the idea here is the following. <clears throat> Even though your qubits may be noisy and have errors, if you really bend over backwards and stretch all the resources as much as you can, maybe by improving the native gates, maybe by making some fancy connectivity between the qubits, or maybe you find some way of getting rid of noise, you can build a top of this. This is what we try to show in these Tetris pieces. You put these uh, Tetris pieces together, and ultimately you're able to perform some calculation using a quantum computer that's outside the reach of classical computing. And this experiment that I showed on, showed on the previous slide is an example of this, where they really, you know, eked every little thing they could out of every component and they were able to execute this measurement or this, <clears throat> this algorithm. Okay, so now I wanna take a, a step back and um, tie it into some of the research that we have been working on. So I wanna ask the question, how are quantum computers programmed? Okay, so here again is this data from before uh, where we saw uh, this point out here using 53 qubits and 20 sequence of 20 logical gates, uh, on, or 20 gates, sorry, on each qubit. So how is this actually programmed? Um, so here's again the processor. So let's just now focus in, on, for example, this little grid here, five qubits and four of these couplers. So here's another figure from this paper. And this is just a, a blow up of this little section right here. So here's the quantum device itself. And remember these gray X's are basically aluminum X's that are roughly 200 by 200 uh, microns wide. So this 
uh, cut out here is on the order of a micron by a micron, let's say. Uh, sorry, uh, is, is on the order of a couple hundred microns by a couple hundred microns. So here on the right is what's called a musical score for programming a quantum computer. And each of these black lines here represent what happens to each qubit. And the x-axis here is time. And these little boxes indicate something that happens to the qubit. I won't go into the details of exactly what happens, but this, for example, logo right here means that you're performing some operation on this specific qubit. And this guy indicates an operation on this qubit. So if you go read the paper, you'll see that one of these cycles is on the order of 50 nanoseconds. So this means that this sequence we're looking at here uh, is roughly, let's say, 500, 400 nanoseconds. So this is a kind of a musical score of instructions about what to do. And you see these couplers here, for example, the green guy, he couples this qubit to that qubit, just as I promised. And this is now what's called a two qubit uh, native gate. So here we couple the qubits. Okay, so this means that here you have quantum hardware. This is the actual qubits themselves. And here you have a classical instruction about what to do on that quantum hardware, right? Because these boxes right here, they're just, you can think of them just like, uh, this is just a, uh, an array, if you like to pro think of classical program, just an array of instructions about what to do in this qubit. This is just an array of instructions about what to do in that qubit. And it's of course easy to write down 53 arrays that each have, let's say, a depth or a number of cycles m equal to 20. Right? This is totally trivial to write down on a classical computer. Okay, so this is how you interface with a quantum computer. So now um, I wanna go a step even further back uh, and talk about a very, very fundamental property of classical computers. In fact, it's so fundamental that um, one barely even thinks about it when just interacting with a computer on a daily basis. So let me return to this picture. So I should say that this is the hand of Barbara Liskov. She's a professor emeritus here at MIT. Uh, she was one of the pioneers of classical algorithm theory and classical data structure theory. And she's holding here a punch card. Uh, so this is an old way to interact with some of the earliest computers. And roughly speaking, the way that these punch cards would work is that some section of the punch card, let's say, for example, left side, would contain some data, and the right side would contain some instruction about what to do with that data. Right? So you can imagine that this data over here is some number, uh, one, you know, 1 million 256, and this uh, uh, sequence over here tells the punch card computer what to do on that data. Maybe this is exactly you know, the sequence that means take the logarithm, let's say. So now what would happen if you took this punch card, flip it around 180 degrees and stick it into the machine? The machine would still, the punch card machine would still try to read the data. It would just read the instructions as data and then it would read the data as instructions. But in principle, the computer can't know the difference. So this means that data and instructions on class computers are basically part and parcel. They're somehow the same thing. Uh, this has a, a fancy name in class computer science. It's called homo iconicity. Uh, the slightly more informal version of this word is uh, code is interchangeable with data. Okay, so this is very, very basic property of essentially all class computers in many, many programming languages. Okay, so at a slightly more abstract level, what's going on here? You can imagine you have some instruction set defined by some function, which could be some you know bit string. Uh, then you feed this bit string into your control layer, and the control layer will say, okay. If I get three zeros, that means maybe do nothing to the first bit. If I get you know, one one zero, then that should be part of an AND gate, and so on and so forth. And so you have an instruction on what to do. You feed it to a control layer that says, okay, I have to execute these sequence of classical logical gates. And then if you actually wanna apply this function to some data, for example, this could be the, the logarithm function. Well, here's your data. You feed it into the function and you get some new number out also represented as a binary number. And again, here you see very clearly that the instructions, the language of the instructions is the same as the language of the data of the algorithm you're trying to learn. Okay, so here the code is classical and the data is classical. So I'll just look at this uh, example I showed before of how to program a quantum computer. So let's just focus, for example, on this panel right here. So this is just a very basic quantum computer with a single qubit inside. And I just want to perform one operation on that qubit. Now, I will still have to tell my classical computer to send some signal down some wire to hit this qubit. And you can imagine you're sitting in a classical lab, all the labs at MIT are classical, you're sitting in this lab and you wanna generate some electric signal that gets delivered to the qubit. That's a classical interface. And so here just as a kind of cartoon, I just show this, uh, this bit string right here, just an example. Maybe this corresponds to performing this specific logical, uh, the specific operation in your qubit. Uh, 
never mind what this actually means. It's not, it's immaterial for this example. So then what happens, you can see these boxes are still gray. Gray means classical computer. Then finally, this um, electrical signal gets delivered down to the quantum device itself. So here I now change the color of the box to blue. So this symbol represents some quantum state that's fed into your function. I now call the function u because that's what we do in quantum computing. And the function that gets applied is something called the Hamiltonian, which is essentially just the interaction uh, between your qubit or the signal in your qubit. And the parameters of this Hamiltonian is given just by the classical bits that you program. Right? You see here are the bits, and they were, they were classical, and now they're being fed to the Hamiltonian, and that's when they become quantum. So here's just an example uh, in, uh, in the multi-qubit case. But the idea is the same, it just looks uh, more intimidating. So here, the code, that is to say the instructions, were classical. You use your classical computer, Python, or whatever, to generate these instructions. But the data itself is quantum. So you could ask yourself, um, can I come up with a scheme for quantum computing where both the data, but also the code itself is quantum, right? So essentially restore the symmetry that we had in classical computing. Okay, so uh, the answer is yes, that's why we're here today. And so I'll focus on one experiment we performed in our lab uh, to show how you can restore this symmetry to classical computers, or to quantum computers. Okay, so let me unpack a little bit what's going here, going on here. There'll be a little bit of math here, but I'll try to keep it uh, keep it uh, as uh, unintimidating as possible. So this box right here is an algorithm called density matrix exponentiation. And the idea here is the following. It's a fixed protocol that implements some quantum operation that's only dependent on the setting of what I'll call the instruction state rho. So rho here is just some, it could be a qubit for example, just some qubit that you have on your device, which is a quantum object. Now you take n copies of these, so you can imagine you have a long register of n of these qubits sitting. You execute this algorithm and you get this operator out, e to the minus i rho theta. And so theta is just an angle, so we can, we can ignore that for now. But the point here is that rho, what used to be a quantum state, which used to be the, the quantum data we operated on, now became a quantum operator. So just like in a few slides back, where I had this Hamiltonian operator, now um, up here in the exponent, now I have a state up here, a quantum state up here in the exponent. Okay, and there's some error associated with this algorithm. I won't uh, bore you with the details of where that comes from. But this algorithm was proposed, in fact, also by this Lord, Seth Lloyd um, a couple of years ago. So what does this mean conceptually? It means that taking this algorithm allows us to load a program into a quantum state, which I'll call the instruction state, I'll also call it maybe the quantum program, or the noted by this Greek symbol rho, and we can execute that quantum program on another quantum system. Right? So this means in some sense, we're kind of back to the state, to, to what we wanted, where uh, the instructions about what to do is stored in a quantum state, let's say it's a quantum object. So you could say, uh, okay, uh, why care about doing this? You know, maybe it like philosophically feels kind of nice to restore this deep symmetry of classical computing to quantum computing, uh, but there's, there's some really appealing uh, practical reasons for doing this. So it turns out this uh, protocol uh, is very efficient for generating quantum instructions. Uh, so it means that this algorithm I showed in the last slide very, very quickly can generate these, uh, um, can generate these uh, quantum operations. So I won't go into too many of the algorithmic details. You know, please ask me questions in the, in the q and I'd be more than happy to, uh, to, uh, to go into details. But I'll just give a brief highlight for those who are maybe a little bit interested in seeing this, that it turns out that there's an exponential reduction in resource requirements over what's called any tomographic strategy. So I'm just gonna spend one second explaining what that means. So you can imagine, you know, if I had given Vladimir n copies of this density matrix of this, of this quantum instruction state, maybe he could just measure it and he could just see what the state was and then generate his own quantum instructions. But what's amazing about this algorithm is that I can send Vladimir enough copies that he can run the algorithm, but not enough copies that he can learn what the quantum state is. Because as, as this experiment, uh, the big experiment I talked about previously showed, if you take enough qubits, it's essentially impossible to classically write down um, the components of that state. So that's one reason why this algorithm is fascinating. Another reason is that the runtime of the algorithm, that is to say, how many of these logical gates do I need, you know, this musical score, how many do I need uh, to execute the algorithm? And it turns out that um, you only need logarithmically many gates um, in the size of the instruction state. So this means that if I again return to this example with 53 qubits from before, it's essentially impossible to classically write down the state of that system. It's just the matrix is simply too big, but 
if you use that state as a quantum instruction state, um, the circuit for doing that or the number of logics and steps is still surprisingly small. So this means that uh, density matrix exponentiation and the use of quantum instructions has found quite a broad range of applications, both in foundations of quantum computing, uh, in surprising uh, ways of using private quantum software, and some practical protocols that are also being pursued in other labs right now. But please ask any questions uh, in the Q&A about this, and I'll be happy to expand, expand upon it. Okay, so let me give you one slide about the physics of what's going on here, and then I'll turn to some of our data. Okay, so let's unpack this thing one more time. So here is now n copies of my instruction state. Remember, these are, for example, qubits. These are two-level systems, so n of those. And now I've also introduced what I'll call a target state. And basically, I just want to implement the quantum instruction stored in this state on that target state. So what you do is you run this operation. It's called a delta swap. And this will be one of the few equations in my talk today. So uh, please forgive me if this gets a little bit in the weed for some people, but I want to make sure that uh, there's a little bit here for the experts as well. So basically this delta swap operation swaps the state of this qubit and this qubit by some amount to delta. Uh, here is the matrix that represents that operation. So one illuminating case is if I put in pi over two, uh, then I get this very simple matrix out, which is one on the uh, zero, zero and the one, one points, but then it's off diagonal in this little subblock. And the interpretation of that, if you're a, a quantum computing person, is that it just swaps the state of the two qubits. Okay, so I, I won't go into details of how to read these, these matrices in case you're not familiar, unfortunately. Again, please ask questions. I'll be happy to expand upon it. But then what you do is you throw away this uh, version of the instruction state. Then you take your next instruction state, you do another of these small swaps by some amount delta, throw it away, do it again with the third version, and throw it away. Okay, and you keep doing this some number n times. And what you get out in the end is this operator e to the minus i rho, and this is exactly what we wanted, that rho is living up here as if it was an operator that's acting on a target state sigma. And over here is this algorithmic error that I mentioned before. Okay, so this is what we're going to be trying to do in the lab. So here is a picture of our device. Uh, now it's a real SEM picture. Uh, and this gray color right here is aluminum, a couple of hundred nanometers thick. And here's a scale bar. So now you actually see the couple of hundred microns that I was talking about before. So here's three qubits laid out like this. The blue lines are for reading out the state of the qubit, and the red and orange lines for controlling the qubit. So here's the target qubit. This is the guy we're going to want to interact, or we're going to uh, want to apply the quantum instructions on. And this is the instruction qubit. And the interesting thing here is we'll just use one instruction qubit, or physically one qubit, but it'll play the role of all n copies. So here was the original algorithm before. And now let me show you how we turn that into an algorithm that just uses two qubits. Uh, so I still have my target state sigma and my instruction state rho. But now what we're doing is instead of having n copies going down like this, we'll have n copies going along like this by approximately resetting rho. Uh, we reset it using a, a specific gate that we call simulated quantum measurement. I won't have time to go into that exactly what it does or how it works, but what it does is that it resets the state of the qubit. So you can imagine if we do the delta swap right here. So let me uh, put up these red boxes so you can see the structure. So um, we uh, delta swap these two guys, and then we approximately reset. And so that leaves us at the same state as right here, where we have almost a new copy of this guy ready to be delta swapped one more time. So we go along like this. And so here we throw away uh, row after each interaction. And here we just approximately reset row after each interaction. So here we're just using two qubits. Um, OK, so there's no such thing as a free lunch, unfortunately. So uh, this new technique we've developed comes with a price. And so what happens is you get a little bit more error in your algorithm. And again, uh, we have some proofs of this in the paper, but, but I'll leave them, I'll leave them now. unspoken for now. OK, so let me just show you some, some data of how this actually looks in real life, and then I'll be happy to take any questions. So here's an example of this algorithm. Let's fix some target state. Let's call it plus y. And please forgive me if this is a little bit obtruse for those not uh, who don't know about quantum um, notation, but unfortunately, I, I, I could find no way around this. So, so forgive the, the, the math here. But let's fix some state pointing along the plus y direction. And let's execute density matrix exponentiation, where we fix the instruction state to be plus x, the number of steps to be n, and the total angle that we want to try to implement this quantum instruction with uh, to be pi over 2. OK, and so if you sit down and do the math, this is a pi over 2 rotation around the x-axis. So here's what the algorithm actually looks like. Here's the delta swaps, as I promised, the approximate reset, and there's four of those. We're going to run the algorithm, 
I'm going to do something called state tomography. This is a technique that lets one look visually at what the state looks like as it comes out. So here's the data. Um, so first, let's just look at the first section here. So I'll grade out this box. Let's just look at the first section here. So the top row here is the state of the target qubit, and the bottom row here is the state of the instruction qubit. And as I promised, the target qubit points along the y direction in this um, globe or the sphere that's called the block sphere. Um, and the instruction qubit points along plus x, just like I promised. Uh, here's just a projection looking down the x-axis um, for both of these states. And this is just showing explicitly the x, y, and z components. So let's take the first step in the algorithm, and you'll see that this state started to move up. The target state started to move, just like it should. An instruction qubit stayed nearly fixed along its initial axis because it was reset by this operation. Let's do a few more steps like that. And what you see in the end is that um, this uh, target qubit moved from pointing along the y direction to pointing along the z direction. Now, if you take your right hand rule and you point your thumb in the direction of x, you do a pi half rotation, like pi half is, is uh, 90 degrees in radians. And so you see you get this state rotation by exactly 90 degrees. And meanwhile, the instruction state stayed nearly unchanged. Uh, it's going in like this into this sphere. There's some physics going on there that I'm also happy to, to talk about. So this is an example of a rotation of a target qubit around an axis given by an instruction qubit. OK, so let me uh, just drop this little math here to show what's going on and just show you one last example of programming these quantum instructions. And I'll be happy to take uh, any questions. So let's just run this algorithm one more time. But now let's change the quantum instruction state and confirm that the program that's executed uh, is changed according to the instruction state. So let's put the instruction state in what's called the zero state that corresponds to pointing along the north and the south pole here. Let's take eight steps in this case instead of four. And let's try to do a full rotation of pi. So if one sits down and do the, does the math of what this corresponds to, you're looking at a pi rotation around the z axis. Okay, here's the algorithm again. So the only thing that changed now is that the uh, instruction qubit is, a, this is, is in the ground state or is in the zero state. Uh, the, the delta swaps are now pi over eight, and we're doing eight of those in total, and here's the approximate reset. Okay, I'll dispense with the animation and just show you the result. Here it is. Um, again, the target qubit starts by pointing along the plus y direction, and this is a little bit easy to look at if you stare down the z-axis, and there's a projection looking down from the top of this sphere. You'll see that this thing did a full pi rotation, let's say 180 degree rotation around the z-axis. And again, the instruction qubit stayed approximately where it should, notwithstanding going into the block sphere a little bit like this. OK, so I hope I've convinced you that you can execute a program that's stored in a quantum state, specifically by putting this, quantum, this instruction qubit in either the zero state or over here in the plus x state. You modify the quantum operation that's applied on another qubit. This was exactly what we set out to do. So with that, let me just leave you with this outro slide and say that this property of homo-iconicity can be restored to quantum computing using this density matrix exponentiation algorithm. We've demonstrated a proof of principle version of the algorithm using sumo qubits and this gate construction for approximately resetting an unstate. And just, I'll spend 20 seconds just mentioning some of the collaborators here. Particularly, I want to highlight uh, Molly Schwartz, who's a research scientist out of Lincoln Lab. We've had a wonderful, fruitful collaboration in this. Uh, three amazing graduate students, Amy Green, Gabriel Samak and Chris McNally that have played an integral role in this project. Fez Bengtsson, uh, who was a graduate student in Chalmers and Sweet, he's now at Google. Iman Marvian is a theorist who was a postdoc here, now he's a professor at Duke. And then of course, head honcho Will, uh, who is the PI on this project. And so I guess uh, with that, um, let's open up the, the Q&A if there's, if there's any questions. Thank you. Oh, uh, Morton, uh, thank you so much for this. Uh, there are uh, certainly, you have opened our eyes to a very different dimension of uh, what we typically talk about. So uh, thanks a lot. <laughs> um, <laughs> Pleasure. With, uh, with, <laughs> with this, uh, what I would like to do is uh, open the floor to any questions. Um, of course, uh, you know, lacking any questions, I'll be asking you a few. Um, so uh, to start things off, uh, and again, uh, you can send me a chat, uh, send everyone a chat or just me, and I'll relay the question to Morton. Alternatively, you can raise your hand and uh, I'll make sure I call upon you. Um, the, uh, I guess the very first question that to just uh, uh, ask, you know, as you were showing us the pi over two and pi rotations, the uh, length of the vector diminished. Yeah. Um, yeah. Is this uh, reminiscent to the 
uh, diminishment in the strength of a signal? Is that the way to think of this? Or? Yeah, that's kind of the way to think about it. So what's going on here is that these qubits have a finite memory. So that is to say, if you take a qubit and you put it in the one state, so you can imagine just taking a two level atom and putting, the, you know, putting an excitation in there. After some time, that excitation will go out of the system. And uh, we call that a coherence time or some version of a coherence time. And so what's happening here is in fact that the qubit, as we're executing this algorithm, the, it's losing its memory. And so if we, if we kept running this algorithm, we'd get a smaller and smaller and smaller vector until essentially it would just be stuck in here in the middle of the block sphere, which is a signifying that we've essentially lost all information about the state. So this is a reflection of memory loss in the system. And it's also a reflection of one more thing, which is I mentioned this roughly 1% error rate in these quantum logical operations. So we have two sources of error. One is the quantum memory, just which is essentially exponentially decaying. And we have a logical uh, errors from the gates, let's say. So when we try to do some specific rotation, that will have some little error rate associated with that. Uh, the amount of error very much depends, right, with, of, on the speed of computation, I would imagine, right? Because your coherence time is only so long. So That's exactly what right. determines the speed of your computation? That's a great question. So that speed is essentially set by the coupling strength between the qubits. And essentially, if you couple your qubits too strongly, you can't turn off the coupling. If you couple them too weakly, your speed of your logical operation would be too slow. And so uh, a huge part of this uh, project I haven't even talked about uh, in this talk is optimizing these logical gate operations. And in fact, what we had to develop to execute this algorithm is what's currently the world's lowest error rate uh, quantum operation um, with an error rate of 0.3%. And so to the best of our knowledge, this is one of the lowest in the fields. And we simply needed this because otherwise we would be uh, completely dominated by the errors of these operations. Now, my questions to you are actually a mix of my own thinking and uh, a lot of help uh, from online chat here. So I'm going to ask another extension of everything we've just been talking about, which is, of course, uh, as the diminishment in the, uh, or the dephasing of your signal right. keeps happening, uh, is there a way to refresh that and uh, start anew? That's a great question. Um, so there are a wealth of techniques that try to, um, it's called echoing out. And the idea is that you can imagine you have some error that rotates you in this plane. If you know what that error is, maybe you could flip your, your, your state over and the error will somehow cancel itself out. Something's called an echo technique. These echo techniques exist for quantum algorithms. Um, in fact, we're working on a follow-up paper now with Gabriel Samak, who's one of the grad students on this project, uh, showing exactly when you can do some echoing techniques and when you can't do some of these echoing techniques. It turns out to be a quite fascinating subject for, for near-term quantum computing. But reading up the state and then simply replicating it because you just read it, would that be an option? A way, the way you would do it in digital logic? <laughs> no, unfortunately not, because quantum computing has this very, very, uh, sometimes annoying property that if you measure the quantum computer, you lose all of its quantum coherence. And so that would essentially you know, stop all the quantum in its tracks and you would be back to a purely classical world and then you'd have to go back and restart the quantum calculation. Um, a question uh, again from, uh, this is from Merrick Hempel. Um, you mentioned using quantum instructions reduces the needed resources. Does your yes. algorithm lower that requirement further? No, uh, it does not. So uh, what our algorithm does, well, let me answer it slightly differently. So what our algorithm does is it trades the use of a single qubit to supply all of these n copies that I talked about, these many copies of qubits, and you just load that into one qubit. Now, it adds a little bit of an error to the algorithm itself, which we have a surprisingly lengthy mathematical proof for this error rate, but nonetheless, there's some additional error in, in your algorithm. Um, so in some sense, it lowers the resource requirements, but at a precision price, you could call it, at, at, at the price of introducing uh, another error model or error, error mode. Uh, all of your measurements are done at uh, cryogenic temperatures, right, to maintain the coherence lifetime? That's right, that's exactly right. Um, so uh, 
and, and the present system that is optimized uh, always uses these aluminum capacitive structures uh, because- That's right. So some folks are in fact using uh, niobium as well. Um, and there's some, I think tantalum is another uh, superconductor that's recently been used in these systems, but aluminum is by far the most uh, widely used material. Okay. And, and so does the scale up of this technology to uh, beyond 54, in this case, 53, <laughs> uh, <laughs> qubits uh, is going to very much depend on the next set of quality fabrication techniques to some extent, or possibly new material discoveries. Very are, much are, so. Are there any insights you can give us there uh, on what is expected, uh, what is needed? What can MIT Nano do <laughs> to, <laughs> right. to help no, out? <laughs> a lot. <laughs> That's the short answer. So uh, there's a really fantastic community of essentially the overlap between the material science and quantum computing, what's called applied quantum computing in this case. And it turns out to be an extremely subtle issue, exactly what's causing this memory loss in these qubits. Of course, uh, we know of the first, let's say, five tallest poles that lead to, these, to this memory loss. But since um, we, you know, we've solved all those poles, so now we're down to you know, the sixth pole trying to figure out what's the next limiting factor. In fact, there was a beautiful experiment out of our own lab that, that I was involved in, uh, where they showed that background radiation you know, there's the ambient radiation in the universe, uh, in fact, impacts the lifetime of qubits um, in some limits right now, because we've really pushed it out so far. Mm -hmm. um, I have one more question uh, that uh, talks about the following. It says, um, uh, how do you represent opera uh, operations that correspond to statistically mixed state for a qubit? Right. So preparing a, a mixed state in general, well, um, if you, for example, take an, an entangled state, there's a protocol for entangling two qubits. I guess I don't, I don't quite know at which level of technicality to answer this question. <laughs> so, so sorry if I'm sort of shooting a little bit in the dark here. But essentially, there's definitely a protocol for generating entangled qubits, obviously. Uh, this is what gives the quantum speedups in general, or a part of what gives quantum speedups. Uh, and the remarkable thing about this algorithm that, that I unfortunately didn't get into is that it works just as well for entangled states, that is to say, uh, a version of mixed states. Um, so, so this algorithm does not care if you input a single qubit like we did in our case, or a, uh, a entangled state, or a mixed, a general mixed state. Got it. More than I'm going to ask you one last question, and unfortunately we're going to have to stop given the time. But uh, the last question I have is uh, regarding the size of the qubits that, uh, in your case, are hundred microns. Uh, why so big? Uh, we're used to much smaller things, <laughs> and when it comes about uh, that, nanoscale <laughs> opportunities. <laughs> Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, and so I should say, you know, if you look at, for example, something called spin qubits, which is a popular version of trying to build or platform for building quantum computers, they really are quite small. They're on the scale of, let's say, 20, 10 to 50 nanometers. So they really are a, a nano fabric. So it turns out that having these large, they're essentially capacitor plates, in fact, makes you insensitive to noise arising from the charge jumping around. You can imagine a very small island of aluminum and one charge jumps on there it'll dramatically change the energy, right? Going from 10 to 11 excitations. But if you go from 1 billion excitations to 1 billion plus 1 excitation, well, that's a very small change in the energy. So this is, in fact, one of the ways in which the field has realized that you can increase the lifetime of the qubits just by changing the geometry of this layout. All right. Uh, Morton, uh, again, uh, I can't thank you enough for uh, providing us such a really pedagogical, insightful, careful way of thinking about quantum computing. I think you have made a whole bunch of extra converts and you might find yourself not being able to accommodate all the grad students that really want to work with you. So, but but again, uh, I will uh, one more time thank you for a fantastic talk. And I will, invite, I will invite everyone to join us again uh, this coming Thursday for the next uh, Nano Explorations. Till then, thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye.